All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Melanie Johnson DeBoffrey, and I'm serving as the interim dean of Drew Theological School at Drew University. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this fantastic event on a, at least on the East Coast, sunny but cool Friday afternoon. Uh, I want to say welcome, especially to all of the st Drew students and faculty, Drew alums, friends of Drew, friends of Catherine, uh, and all of you across the US and really across the globe who are with us today for this great event. It is a wonderful day of celebration as uh, we celebrate the launch of uh, Dr. Catherine Keller's new book. Facing Apocalypse, Climate, Democracy, and Other Last Chances. As many of you know, Dr. Katherine Keller serves as Drew's uh, George T. Cobb Professor of Constructive Theology. I'm going to recognize that we really want to hear about the book and hear from Catherine and suggest that Catherine needs no introduction. Uh, her body of work is broad and deep and is known widely in all different networks uh, of scholarship and activism of theology and uh, ecclesial conversations. Um, and her long career of teaching and mentoring, these things really speak for themselves. Uh, I want to, however, name the important uh, topic of this book in terms of it being so crucial for our times. And of course, I use the word time, being a scholar of more space and place myself. What Catherine and I know and you all know is that time and space uh, are never separated from each other. And perhaps all the more so with regard to climate crisis and apocalypse, time and space are both fulsomely uh, urgent questions in these two areas of thinking. And uh, I am so grateful that Dr. Keller has brought them together and all of their beautiful complexity and urgency for us to um, explore and turn again and again the challenge of stepping from thinking into action and from action back into thinking always again and again, which is what we try to do at Drew, which I think those of you who know Drew know that. I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests who are with us. We'll introduce them a little bit more in a moment, but Dr. John Tatamino, Dr. Carol Wayne White, Dr. Stephen Moore, and Mr. Trip Fuller, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. We are grateful that you are a part of this conversation and we're looking forward to thinking together uh, with you about Catherine's uh, fantastic work. Without much ado, I'm going to hand it over to Catherine, but I'd also like to introduce our moderator for the day, and that's Daniel Seidel. He is a second year PhD student in our theology and uh, theological and philosophical studies in religion program. Uh, he works closely with Dr. Keller exploring the relationships and intersections between art, theology, and curatorial practices. He is trained as an art historian and has over 20 uh, years of experience as an art um, curator. So welcome, Dan. Thank you for your uh, moderating for us today. Uh, but I'm going to yield the floor to our honored uh, book publisher, Dr. Catherine Keller. Well, thank you, Dean Johnson de Beaufray, for launching this event. I'm, of course, hopeful that it is a model for welcoming future Drew books. Thanks to my publisher, Daniel Ellsberg of Orbis. And hey, thanks to every one of you. <laughs> I want to offer mega gratitude for your showing up at all to something called Facing Apocalypse. Really, it's a nice spring day. Who needs another Zoom to doom? So I don't even know that I would show up if I hadn't written it. So I better say why I did. To put it simply, we are not in our lifetimes going to get away from the apocalypse, from the word, the signal, the echo of an ancient text. If it were just a born again, Jesus is coming soon apocalypse, we might be tired enough of it to ignore it. Nothing new there. Or on the other hand, it might mean a more recent sort of secularist 
we are doomed determinism, often about global warming. Either way, not really much point in arguing. So we might just write off the apocalypse as a cliche, an overused trope of a, we are saved, praise the Lord, denialism, or then again, of a too late, why bother, nihilism. Either way, self-fulfilling prophecies of doom are spinning around in and out of religion and between a junk optimism and a paralyzing pessimism. But still, I thought I had left such work behind in the last millennium with Apocalypse Now and Then, my feminist guide to the end of the world. For this millennium, I thought I'd leave the apocalypse to true scholars of the text, like Stephen Moore. But it became clear that there will continue a proliferation of apocalyptic pronouncements that can't be just written off. They don't belong to the vicious circle of denialism and nihilism. They're using the sign of apocalypse differently. For instance, as I began this book, the so-called insect apocalypse was buzzing in my brain. You know, due to climate change and agribusiness chemicals, the insect population has plunged precipitously in the three continents studied. And it is the basis, of course, for the whole food chain, not to mention crop pollination. The entomological message is not that it is now simply too late though. The point is more creepy and crawly. It's to reveal a catastrophic danger of our collective situation so that we might face it and just possibly respond to it responsibly. And these examples multiply. During the last fire season, the LA Times headline flashed repeatedly, a climate apocalypse now. Subtitle, climate change is only worsening the record breaking wildfires, heat and air pollution in California and the West. But again, the point is not game over, California is toast, but wake up. The situation exceeds the natural and needed cycle of wildfires. Catastrophe is kicking in for the long haul. It does not add up to the end of the habitable world or even of California. Yet it might, short of adequate speed and scale of response to climate change, so the empirical reality of climate change will assure a secular public rhetoric of apocalypse for the foreseeable future. And some of it will use the notion of apocalypse quite accurately. The biblical term apocalypsis does not mean the end. It means unveiling, eye-opening, which is never comfortable, but it discloses it does not merely close down. There is no flat end of the world anywhere in the Bible. Many endings, yes, as Donowski <laughs> Rivera Castro reminds us, thinking not of the Bible, but of indigenous peoples in the ends of the world. Many, many endings. In the Bible, there are mass destructions, human and non-human but no totality of termination. Under pressure of collective crisis, new possibilities are recognized to open up. And it's because we won't escape such pressures that I figured more of us need to spend a bit more time meditating with the apocalypse itself. No mere metaphor, but a metaphors. Of course, it is not only climate change that is evoking apocalypse, is it? Speaking of evocative, watch for J. Cameron Carter's forthcoming book, The Religion of Whiteness, an apocalyptic lyric, coming soon. Or let me cite my friend of four decades, Rita Nakashima Brock, who wrote this in response to January 6. As I watched news reports of the violence deep into the night, I had the unsettling thought that I was watching a national apocalypse unfold. Thoughts about apocalypse had been on my mind as the pandemic surged 
and George Floyd's murder captured global attention, igniting the largest social movement in US history. Like most critical thinkers, Rita had always resisted apocalyptic thinking because far-right evangelicals predictably use disasters to deflect all challenges to their white male supremacy. And of course, that edge of apocalypse was in play among the conspiracy cults like QAnon that helped fire up the January round of Trumpocalypse. But for instance, Rita now deploys apocalypse with hermeneutical precision to mean great crisis with revelatory impact. In an odd resonance, the current Time Magazine features the cover story, Climate is Everything, an apoc apocalyptic totalization? Actually, not at all. The author Justin Worland's point is precisely not that climate is the only issue that matters. It's that there is finally significant public recognition that climatization touches everything else. So the article cites, for instance, Jacqueline Patterson, who heads the climate justice program for the NAACP, which has embraced climate action as crucial to racial justice. Economy, food, housing, transit, she writes, all of these are civil rights issues and climate issues intersect with every single one. Such intersectionalism unveils the extent of US white supremacist exceptionalism and at the same time, it challenges the single issue politics of much progressive exceptionalism. The intersectionality, however, can overwhelm, it can lose focus, it can feel impossible. And yet at the same time, it unveils the chance for solidarities broad enough, strong enough to alter the world. Still, what does such revealing intersectionality have to do with the archaic imagery of the book of Revelation? That old letter certainly did not foresee racism, neoliberal capitalism, or its carbon emissions, democracy, or its demise. And as my book is at pains to insist, John of Patmos was not predicting the facts of any future prophecy in the biblical tradition <clears throat> does not signify prediction of future facts. Prophets discern civilizational patterns entrenched so deeply that they are likely to last, to keep repeating themselves way too long. Prophecy is a kind of radical dream reading, which in turn invites our dream reading of the text. <clears throat> Those civilizational patterns are encoded for John of Patmos as the two beasts of sea and land, signifying the global power of the Roman Empire, and as the whore of Babylon, code for Rome's version of global trade, hence the 28 luxury commodities that John lists as no longer available when she falls jewels, purple dye, wine, etc., cetera, et cetera, and climactically slaves, comma, human bodies. The merchants, John intones, were the magnates of the earth. When I worked on the image of Babylon back in the last millennium, I was fixated on the, on the misogyny of John's image of a sex worker, and that can't be erased. But in this round, I couldn't help avoid John's intended point. And that meant dream reading his imperial porn queen as ancestor of the lascivious desire cultivated by neo-imperial capitalism. Of course, politics and economics have undergone immense shifts in 2000 years, some very promisingly anti-imperial but I wonder if we might not agree that civilizational patterns of power and greed have nonetheless managed to bring us to our present edge. And on that edge, global warming is also dream readable in John. The seventh seal opens after a dramatic pause, revealing 
one third of the trees of the earth burnt down, one third of the life of the sea dying, and an eagle lamenting, alas, alas, to all the inhabitants of the earth. Is she voicing what is now called eco grief in the face of mass extinction? And the eagle later cries out, now is the time for the destruction of the destroyers of the earth. Not for the destruction of the earth as fundamentalists interpret it. <clears throat> so I felt that this archaic tumult of symbols matters now because it keeps on materializing. Not because the book of Revelation is so wise and true. The apocalypse is not Torah, it is not gospel, and it cannot, it must not compete with climate science or with anti-racist education or LGBTQI discourse. I realized that more of us who are concerned with the public public effects of religious symbols need to help each other face the ancient apocalypse. First of all, in order to face our own fears of present doom. Yes, even post-Trump. Most of us, not just academics and certainly not just Christians, may want to face the political theology of apocalypse. It's messianic anti-imperialism. It's warning of mounting and planetary destruction. It's bitterly violent righteousness, as well as its urban utopia. So I'm hoping that an exercise in dream reading the apocalypse helps to surface potentials working unconsciously and collectively, not as timeless archetypes, archetypes but as timeful potentialities of our culture. By minding those metaphors, both reactionary and revolutionary, both destructive and constructive, both sacralized and secularized, we might reconfigure their effects. This is not so that some glittering new Jerusalem will finally descend from heaven. But maybe the metaphors of apocalypse can enliven the fragile and down to earth hope of communal life, even urban life, transformed transnationally and renewed ecologically, of planetary health, human and so much more than human. It is a hope that cannot be confused with optimism, even in a suddenly friendlier United States. It's a hope that can embrace our fear, our despair, but the old apocalyptic utopia might refresh our immediate struggles with also a sip of its water of life, free for all. We will not escape the challenges, the challenges that keep roaring into the daily news cycles, but we might together bear with them. Then the specter of the end of time might just twist into more inviting possibilities in time. In our time now, our time here, these possibilities do sparkle in the darkness of improbability. Some may be last chances, but real chances. Amen. And thank you. And now I want to thank in advance our four sparkling panelists uh, for sharing their responses today. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Our first speaker is Dr. John J. DeTamino. He's the Associate Professor of Theology and World Religions at Union Theological Seminary. And he will offer a 10 minute uh, reflection. And we have three more distinguished panelists who will add to our collective uh, dream reading together of uh, Dr. Keller's, um, uh, Dr. Keller's book. Well, this particular panelist is closer to extinguished than distinguished, but I'll give it uh, a go.
I'm grateful to be part of this conversation and I have been keeping company with the birthing of this book for some time now. I was with Catherine in one of the uh, really deeply poignant scenes she paints in Pittsburgh as we visited the Tree of Life Synagogue, a visit she describes so well in this book. And despite having read parts of this book in this way for some time, I still find myself wowed and undone by the final product. So please receive what I have to say. It's just a first pass for me for what I know will be a larger conversation continuing to the AAR uh, in the fall and hopefully beyond. Utopia quietly left the lamb for another Messiah, modernization. Phew, what a sentence. That quote is one of like density that can be found on any page. Pick a page, I dare you, and find a single one that does not house a sentence of comparable fecundity and explosive power. I can assure you that you will find no such page. Or how about a few pages later? Quote, the good place is running out of time. The good time is running out of place, close quote. There's no point trying to securely wrap one's mind around such dictums. They seem to function to trigger detonations into new ways of thinking and living. Reading Catherine Keller's Facing Apocalypse can therefore be a dizzying adventure. What I mean to suggest by making this first observation is that the work of dream reading that Catherine undertakes in Facing Apocalypse has produced a text that likewise calls for what she calls dream reading. Not a rushed reading as academic exercise, but rather an exercise strictly analogous to Catherine's own meticulous, careful unfolding of John's Apocalypse. In other words, Catherine has produced a book that itself demands dream reading, which is another way of saying that Facing Apocalypse is thus an apocalyptic text about an apocalyptic text. <laughs> Do I exaggerate? Well, I'll let others who are part of the conversation weigh in. I, for one, think not. The resonance, the reverb, as Catherine puts it, flows in multiple directions. And this requires some attention between John's time and our time, between John's text and our time, between Catherine's text and the Johannine text and so on. Uh, I won't try to map these flows between texts and temporalities that facing apocalypse sets in motion as that is likely beyond my capacities. But it's a book that sets in motion these processes precisely because it seems to be about illuminating the nature of temporality itself. Of course, namely to insist that temporality remains open, unfinished, and even now, even in this late hour, replete with possibility. I hope Catherine will forgive me for venturing this grand claim after what is still after all an early reading. But if there is a single word that I would call out as, and I'm using the definite article here, the holy word in this book, I would nominate possibility. <laughs> this nomination should of course be no surprise to this company of process kin. For Whiteheadians, God is after all possibility itself. But oh, what a blessing now, even in this darkening hour, to hear the gospel of possibility proclaimed afresh. No, the show isn't over. No, last chances remain. Neither biblical literalists or certain kinds of nihilistic scientistic determinists are right to pull down the curtains on history. Even now, it's not too late. Catherine writes, God speaks, this is a quote, God speaks for the first time since the opening chapter to say 
See, I am making all things new. Uh, continuing the quote, this is far from the numbing presumption that God simply produces a whole new universe to take the place of the old one. Revelation is not about making all new things, but about making all things new. I hope you see what I mean about the power of certain of these sentences. They, they evoke energies that uh, require considerable effort to, to, so, to hold and to, to, and to process. I got a source and embodiment of possibility is present hovering over texts and times, refusing all who would pronounce deterministic doom, whether that doom is proclaimed in the name of biblical literalism or a certain kind of nihilistic determinism. In fact, much of this book is about resisting the closures, strangely allied closures proclaimed by these oddest of bedfellows. So it turns out, and this is meticulously demonstrated, that rhetorics of apocalypse poorly understood plagues both camps. Insect Armageddon and other like phrases are now just as likely to come from the scientific left as the fundamentalist right. Hence this book's urgent call for minding the apocalypse. And this brings me to my two questions. And they're both about practice. And, and these, are, these are somewhat roughly formulated, but it's because I'm still trying to get a hold of um, what Catherine is seeking to do here. I want to ask about what kind of practice dream reading is. This is a central trope in the book. And I find myself asking, uh, a number of questions. Some are answered in the book, but I, I'd still like to hear. What does the dream reader read? Temporalities, for sure. Texts, certainly. But I have a sense that not all texts permit of dream reading. It seems a genre specific reading practice. Are there texts that can't be dream read? Can process and reality be dream read? <laughs> Some of us might think that we are all the time. Uh, can the Bhagavad Gita be dream read? So I, I, I have a sense that the, what Catherine's trying to name here and I note that I do think it is possible to read temporality in this way, dream reading temporality to, to discern deep patterns that keep recurring across widely separated temporalities. But, but I don't think every text permits of dream reading. It, it might well be that only certain kinds of texts, apocalyptic texts in particular, uh, permit of it. So I, I'd like to hear a little bit about what this, how she understands dream reading. The other practice that, that I'm really curious about is uh, the practice of minding. I didn't do a, I do have the, the, the Kindle edition, so I suppose I could have done a search uh, and counted every instance of uh, the words mind, minded, minding, mindfully. And some, some version of this, some version of this um, word floats consistently through the text. What I'm trying to figure out about this practice is how it resonates or doesn't resonate with a more traditionally Buddhist understanding of mindfulness. I have an intuition that there's a rich commensurability between Catherine's use of this word and um, Buddhist uses, but dominantly 
minding in this text is, seems to be a textual practice, not uh, um, a, a practice one does sitting on the meditative But that's about it. Um, it. It is a resolutely focused text. I mean, there are openings towards interreligious diversity, but it is a focused text seeking to accomplish a certain reading of one particular Johannine text. So I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of that, sorry. Uh, but I sense that if the kind of minding that Catherine wants us to do is to live beyond and uh, in a broader spaciousness um, that might be interreligious, there might well need to be a kind of connection between the kind of minding she calls for and the mindfulness that uh, we customarily associate with the Buddhist traditions. I hope you see that um, these questions are really tentative. They are the formulations of someone going through uh, a, well, not quite a first pass with, with the finished book, but close to. Uh, and I hope they in no way are meant uh, or received to uh, as, a, as a calling into question this really remarkable, rich and profound uh, text. As I said, this is itself an apocalyptic text. And, uh, and I look forward to further readings and further conversations. Thank you very much, Dr. Tatamino. Um, I had I wrote a, a note in the uh, in the chat. Um, at the last 30 minutes of our session, we will um, we'll have questions from the audience. We'll open them up. Uh, what we'll do for the sake of the numbers of those um, attending, we have almost 180. Um, if you could type out your question in the chat, either to the, everyone or to me directly, and I will uh, work through the questions and ask the questions of Dr. Keller or the other, other panelists to, uh, to curate our, our conversation. And so with that, um, our second speaker is Dr. Carol Wayne White, and she is the Presidential Professor of Philosophy of Religion at Bucknell University. Thank you for coming, Dr. White. Thank you, um, Van. And um, I want to um, say I'm delighted to join you all today. And I thank Melanie and Catherine for this um, exciting opportunity to participate in this book launch event. And I offer my appreciation to all of those who, who, work, who work behind the scenes to allow me to participate in this space and share this wonderful um, forum with um, admirable colleagues. So um, one final thing, I, I have to leave um, around 4, 4, 10, 4 or 5, and um, because of a scheduling conflict, and I regret I won't be able to participate in some of the ensuing discussions. So um, it's interesting to hear John talk about the word mind, M-I-N-E, and mind. But because I felt in my experience of this text, there's so much to mine and appreciate in Catherine's capacious, very rich meditation. Um, and I experienced it as a meditation and read it as a meditation. Um, this particular study conjoins elements, concerns, and experiences such as race, class, sex, ecology, politics, and science that are usually kept apart by and for many individuals in the 21st century in response to the felt precarity of life. Of course, anyone familiar with Catherine's theological brilliance would not be surprised to see that 
and attending critically to the term apocalypse itself, she reveals some of the paradoxes inherent in the term itself, as well as the continuing effects of trauma-induced apocalypticism, apocalypticism in our era. For me, her work reveals our generation as an apocalypse intoxicated set of devotees, whether religious, secular, political, or scientific, that is co continuously nurtured by various forms of human exceptionalism. Such human exceptionalisms have been historically reflected in explicit and implicit forms of speciesism, acts of ecological degradation, and the various ill-informed isms that have dictated uh, human, social, political, and economic relations with each other. And she writes about these within the text itself. Very capacious, very capacious um, book. In holding our collective 21st century context in relation to the ancient one, um, the ancient letter written by the biblical author, Catherine's work has been most significant for me in terms of its disclosure or its understanding of apocalypse, which addresses John's fascinating insight. It addresses apocalypse as an opportunity for us to come to terms with robust forms of human exceptionalism that we have constructed and an opportunity to open ourselves to what sort of humans we might become. And I'm speaking as a religious naturalist. She thus invites us to read her book as echo political practice. Such practice, she claims, aims at, act, aims at actualization for what is actually possible. Part of the confounding logic of such disclosure, I suggest, hinges on the ingenious insight that Catherine evokes with the term world and how the world exists as the timely context of its inhabitants. In other words, she does this beautiful exegetical understanding of what, how we humans construct worlds. As she states, worlds in that sense have ended over and over in conquest and enslavement, in human genocide, in non-human extinctions, but also in radical change. Thus, as she persuasively argues, impending climate disaster has not brought us to the end times, but to a time of manifold last chances, or in other words, Apocalyptic urgency pulses in a new way through the spectrum of human struggles. As a religious naturalist, I see Catherine's eco-political discourse as a critical intervention in humanistic thinking, or as an urgent reminder that we cease to overthink the world. Doing so, I overthinking, has spawned much contemporary end times discourse that variously glorify nihilism, triumphalism, and certitude. Rather, Catherine's echo political practice invites us to feel ourselves in the world, feel ourselves in the world in the most expansive sense of that word, in our relationships with each other and with the more than human experiences, processes, and sensibilities that we encounter, forces as well. Put another way, for me, Catherine's language of, of uncovering apocalypse is to open multiple registers of effect. These effects involve traumatic, mournful, furious, hopeful, and ironic sensibilities. At the heart of this study for me then is that apocalypse is forceful in how it unsettles, terrifies, and yet ironically appeals to us or those of us who are charmed by the possibility 
of becoming other than we are. In short, I experience her book as a terrifying beauty, felt reverberations across the centuries, as well as felt reverberations between and among humans that are evoked by echo po politics of humility, ambiguity, and resilience. Such is the confounding beauty of her message, I believe. This terrifying beatific vision is the possibility of novelty in a fuller cosmological sense. Thus for me, Catherine's meditation provides the perfect form of distraction. Distraction from our current age's obsession with spurious apocalyptic meta-narratives, nihilism, deterministic certainty, and triumphalism, and towards attentiveness to how we feel ourselves with each other and with the more than human worlds of which we are constituted. Think about this, echo political practice. How does one practice except through one's body? And paying attention to one's body as we mourn. For those of us who were horrified by the, the tape of George Floyd, for those of us who are continuously are horrified by the anti-Asian, anti-Black, anti-Semitic, and other forms of human exceptionalism, do you not feel yourself when you're experiencing these horrific truths that have become part of our trauma-induced apocalyptic era? Thus, what I'm trying to suggest then is that I believe the practice that Catherine is having us think about is actually a disclosure, a new way of seeing how our thinking changes both how we think and feel. It's also an effect or type of effect that registers in the micro worlds of which we are a part. In other words, think about the local climates, the temperatures, the rhythms, the sounds, and other intensities of place, how they help to compose the qualities of lived experience. Here, beyond here, reverberating throughout materiality. Commitment to this type of echo political practice, I suggest is basically understanding interspecies concern and intraspecies health, both of which will not obscure heterogeneities in order to arrive at some ideal of an undifferentiated and harmonious whole. Rather, as Catherine William E. Connolly, another thinker suggests there's felt quality that helps us to interpret and embrace a world of becoming replete with loose and partial connections. I emphasize that, loose and partial connections. On this view then, the meta-narrative of climate change is more than a discrete issue demanding political attention and response. For me, this beautiful, terrifying text, and it is both beautiful and terrifying. This echo political practice that Catherine invites us to is a novel practice of becoming other than we have been. It resonates with process metaphysics. It resonates with religious naturalism. There's so many other different cosmological understandings that beneath the surface of conscious, what humans have made the I, it, there's this felt quality. And I'm going to end by suggesting then that attentiveness to such may possibly, because there is no triumphalism here, 
may possibly help us to alter large scale actions and responses that we are traditionally associated with such human constructs as embodied justice or love. Thank you, Catherine, for this meditation. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. White. Um, as I've been scanning over the, um, uh, the attendees, I've, uh, I've noticed that there are so many friends of Dr. Keller's and of Drew, of the Drew community, and also um, attendees whose books that I've read over the, pa over the past few years. And uh, I'd like you, uh, for those that are interested in, in, um, in asking questions, to utilize the chat, but also to utilize the chat as a guest book. Uh, to um, to write your um, to mark your presence to greet Dr. Keller and the Drew community it would mean a lot I know to Dr. Keller and uh, and us here at the Drew community to have marked um, uh, your presence this is an uh, an important event for us all and uh, and a new event so uh, we'd love for you to do that our third um, our third speaker is Dr. Stephen Moore he's the Edmund S. Jaynes, Professor of New Testament Studies at Drew Theological School. Thanks, Jan. At last, uh, the long-awaited sequel, uh, the sequel to what? Uh, some of you may innocently be asking, uh, but only if you came in late, uh, why uh, the sequel to Apocalypse Now and Then a Feminist Guide to the End of the World, of course, uh, Catherine's 1996 book on Revelation and its reception history. Uh, it was uh, the second uh, book-length feminist study of Revelation to appear, but the most sophisticated in its methodology and the most theological in its, well, theology. Uh, Facing Apocalypse, however, uh, the seeming sequel uh, so surpasses Apocalypse now and then as to turn it into a prequel. Uh, Facing Apocalypse is also a darker book. Uh, it repeatedly takes us to the brink of dystopia, causes us to teeter on the edge of the abyss. Uh, the now and then of the earlier title seems in retrospect to invite a certain nonchalance about apocalypse. After all, uh, the Cold War had just ended, we had emerged from our nuclear bunkers, uh, the birds were chirping cheerfully, and although Donald Trump had already revealed on Oprah that he was considering running for president, uh, that announcement then prompted, bemused, uh, chuckling rather than reflexive reaching for the Book of Revelation or the Bill of Rights. In short, it was easier for some of us to hope then, and Apocalypse Now and Then is not apologetic about doing so. Uh, its author urges that those of us, quote, who are committed to a hopeful planetary future avail ourselves of the living sources of apocalyptic hope. Uh, the book brilliantly refashions those living sources so that they become a counter apocalypse. And of that counter apocalypse concept, its creator states, I hope it converts emergency into emergence, second coming into a sustainable becoming I hope it lets a playful spirit displace the dooming demons of every determinism. I hope above all that it releases an energy of hope. In facing apocalypse, uh, the and then of apocalypse now and then has melted uh, like an Arctic ice flow and the now has reared up in our faces as we are indeed facing it. Uh, that is not to say that facing apocalypse is entirely without hope, but it's a chastened hope, a haunted hope, a hope that, as Catherine puts it, cannot cut free of its own doubt. She continues, it recognizes itself as grasping at effectual language and sometimes at straws, 
It presses beyond flat factualities, secular or fundamentalist, and beyond despairing abnegation. It faces the unspeakable catastrophes that may become inevitable if we do not speak, if we glide into apocalyptic normalization. What has intervened in the quarter century between Keller's Apocalypse Volume 1 and her Apocalypse Volume 2? Well, climate change principally, of course, uh, or more precisely, climate change become apocalyptically cat catastrophic. I can locate only three passing mentions of the overheating climate in Apocalypse Now and Then. But facing apocalypse is from start to finish written in the face of its withering furnace blast. That is not to say that facing apocalypse is an unrelentingly uh, grim book. It is indeed uh, a delightfully written book, uh, a fun read even, uh, despite its singularly uh, unfunny subject matter, which merges the receding uh, Trump apocalypse with the looming climate apocalypse. Uh, its author is singularly well qualified to pronounce on matters apocalyptic, noting at one point that her name is thrice seven letters if you include her middle name. Uh, this had me anxiously counting the letters of my own name on my fingers, uh, only to discover uh, to my horror that my first name also contains seven letters uh, that my last name in combination with the two initials of my middle names also comes to seven and that the first of those middle names constitutes uh, yet a third series of seven. Uh, managing not to scream, uh, I then set to reflecting. How does Revelation do what it does uh, insidiously on the micro scale, egregiously on the macro scale? Uh, Catherine insists that metaphors is too feeble a term for the visceral visions that crawl out of Revelation's bottomless abyss. abyss. Uh, metaphorce, F-O-R-C-E, would be a more apt term, she suggests. Uh, metaphors may sound like a Saturday morning cartoon superhero team, but the term perfectly encapsulates what Revelation is and does. For Revelation is a second level force, a metaphor that generates innumerable other forces that in turn generate innumerable affects and effects. Uh, affects stick as affect theorist Sarah Ahmed has taught us and among the stickiest of the affects that the apocalyptic metaphors spawns is the numerological affect, the destiny portending adrenaline pumping numbers that engender fascination and fear in equal measures. And these affect saturated numbers have in our own supposedly secular era slithered out of their religious holding tank and affixed themselves irremovably to our fears and hopes for our planet. We may smile superciliously in hindsight at the heady rush of emotions triggered in Hal Lindsey era apocalyptic evangelicals as the number of member nations in what was then the European common market neared uh, 10 at which point uh, they fervently believed the 10 nation confederacy predicted by Daniel and Revelation would have been formed and a crucial piece of the world spanning apocalyptic jigsaw would have slotted into place with a deafening clang. The numbers on which many of us attuned to the climate crisis fixate are more elementary, uh, kindergarten elementary indeed, uh, but no less apocalyptic. We need only to be able to count to two as the doomsday clock is now reduced to two digits. Uh, Professor Keller elucidates the mathematics of this simple but chilling device. Uh, quote, even as hope was melting away from the modest Paris climate agreement, 
to keep the average global temperature rise between two degrees centigrade, we learned that no, uh, 1.5 is the limit for avoiding catastrophe. And we have recently reached a one degree rise above pre-industrial temperatures, uh, the warmest in 10,000 years, uh, end quote. Uh, two times and half a time, as the author of Revelation might say, channeling Daniel. Uh, the half a time now become the deadly switch between the two times in the apocalyptic time bomb. Uh, hear the trumpets, uh, Catherine asks. We do hear the trumpets and we did hear the Donald J. trumpet, uh, loudest of the climate deniers and the one who lost us four years while the open-jawed eco-apocalypse rushed toward us. And it was no accident that the most vociferous voice for climate denial also happened to be more than any previous US president, more than any previous head of state, the veritable personification of capitalism at its most unfettered. Uh, climate catastrophe is the ultimate product of capitalist excess, as we all know. Uh, capitalism has become an apocalyptic force then, but is capitalism itself subject to apocalyptic calculation? It has become commonplace in certain circles to claim that we currently find ourselves in a situation where the end of the world is now imaginable, but the end of capitalism is not. But this hardly seems true for the climate apocalypse at its most cataclysmic contains the ultimate dissolution of capitalism within its voracious uh, virtual maw. Uh, back when Catherine was penning Apocalypse Now and Then, and the term late capitalism was beginning to trip off academic tongues, we didn't actually know how capitalism, uh, oh, so late, uh, living assisted old, would or could pass away. Uh, now we do, but this is not how anyone should want capitalism to die. At the end of Facing Apocalypse, uh, Catherine, in effect, like John of, pa of Revelation, uh, eats the scroll uh, at once bitter and sweet, so she can prophesy, like John, about peoples and nations, but the scroll she eats is Revelation itself. She ends her own neo-apocalyptic book with seven visions, uh, a fitting supplement to John's seven fixated book of visions. In the first and second of St. Catherine's visions, uh, those she titles Exhumanity and Brute Remainders, capitalism is dead. She does not say so explicitly because it is, it is not the demise of an economic ideology she is mourning so much as the unthinkable human suffering that accompanies it. In Catherine's third vision, uh, New Jeru for the few, uh, capitalism is alive, uh, but not well. It has mutated into a yet more monstrous incarnation of its most unjust present forms. Uh, Catherine's fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, vision, seventh visions then follow. Uh, the movement from one to seven in Catherine's vision sequence entails a gradual lightening of the blood dark apocalyptic sky from the very worst to the still pretty bad, but it is the best that the hope chastened Catherine of facing apocalypse is able to muster. Her climactic vision is not without its utopian elements, however, uh, tendrils of utopian hope snaking up out of the toxic dystopian wasteland through which she has led us. And one of those tendrils concerns capitalism. Uh, unregulated capitalism is dethroned, she prophesies about that near future time through social insistence and ecolo ecological sanity. And the two-digit neo-apocalyptic doomsday clock. 
Through greener, newer deals, we keep the warming to two-ish degrees, uh, Catherine writes, but really uh, prays, and we should all pray with her. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, I've just been going through the chats. It's uh, ab absolutely amazing, um, the friends of Dr. Keller and uh, Drew that are present here today. So I want to thank you all for spending time on this uh, Friday afternoon uh, to be with us. Our fourth and, uh, and final panelist is Dr. Trip Fuller. He's postdoc research fellow in theology and science at the University of Edinburgh. He's also the host of Homebrewed Christianity podcast, which you've, if you've not heard it, um, although I'm sure many of you uh, who are present have been a guest on it, um, if you've not heard it, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful podcast and so helpful. It's been helpful to me in my theological education. All right. So uh, this is totally thrilling. Um, if you just scroll through the participants list and you're me, you realize that there are like 30 people present that should probably talk more, except that I've gotten to read the book twice. So for this little smidget of time, I have a real small advantage. And I had 13 post-it notes of ideas I hope no one before me mentioned. And I have four of them left, which means this Baptist preacher with a PhD in philosophy of religion might finish in under 10 minutes without crying. Now, um, here, is what's so exciting about this book. When Catherine was like, check it out, but maybe you, you, maybe you want to write an endorsement for it. And I read it and I was like, all oh, junk. This is like, you know, when you read the Catherine Keller book that just came out for the first time and you get super pumped and excited. And do you read that theology book that's so good and brings all things together and it just is going to animate preachers that probably wouldn't normally read theology books that you really like them to read, but they should do it so the church doesn't suck as much? And it's both of those in one book. I was like, oh, my goodness. So here's my goal, because I know most of you haven't read this book. I want to provide a lure, not for you to use the book. I've seen the list of people here. I want you to assign it to people who are going to be in congregations and are stuck with the mainline Protestant, you know, the liberal Christian problem that Catherine had. She's like, look, um, Revelation. It, uh, let's, you know, when we thought about kicking it out of canon, not a horrible idea. I've already wrote one book out. Are you going to make me do it again? And guess what? She did. And that's what is so powerful about this book. She doesn't dodge it. She just, just like, let me level up my biblical street cred. This book is, is exactly uh, you know, like what she talks about. It's, it, you know, it does dream reading. It looks at the future, not as a fact, usually used to justify imperial uh, politics, maybe throw some really sweet foreign policy into symbols related to animals and dragons. Um, but the future is not a fact. It's a possibility to be faced. And this text that is so embarrassing for so many in the church because of how Reagan and tag team partners on the religious imperialist right used it, we just want to mute it. In fact, I was a minister the whole time I was doing my PhD at Claremont at a UCC church there. I just didn't want people to ask about the book. I'm just like, don't talk about it. Um, and I was a mile and a half from late, the origin place of late great planet Earth on, on the uh, peninsula of Palos Verdes in uh, Southern California. And so there are a lot of people with their like used copies in a congregation that is very progressive. They'd occasionally bring it up to me and I would just get triggered and go like, I wish it had, wasn't in canon. But now I could go back in time and say, no, I'm glad it's there because now I get to recommend facing the apocalypse. Now, here's why I had such a problem with it. If you get the wrong nightmare, when you wake up, you're going to live it out. Now, sometimes we get the right nightmare and you wake up and you have to, I don't know, rise to new life. But sometimes you get the wrong nightmare and you wake up filled with anxiety and then it gets played out with uh, 
top-down power and imperial context in uh, seizing resources and possessing more things and xenophobia. And you could see how these the wrong nightmare plays out. And, and I was a Baptist church planners kid in the South, but I was like an edgy Baptist. You know, we liked women and felt really good about it. Uh, and religious diversity in rural North Carolina was what kind of Baptist you were. And all the other Baptists had charts about Revelation. We didn't talk about it at our house because we knew what that book was about and we were just going to dodge it. And then I went to the wrong youth camp and they had a 20 foot whiteboard. And by the end of three days, I had gotten the wrong nightmare and I went home and asked my dad a few questions. And he said, they talk about what? And I'm like, yeah, you wouldn't believe this. And I started like explaining it out. And I'm like, give me a pen and paper, dad. I figured it out. And I'm like laying it out. And he's like, this is, I'm gonna have to talk to your youth minister. You know, and, and I say that because I just was like my one encounter close with that. And I like in an environment where everyone believes this is just immediately obvious. All of a sudden this grid is set on the world. And then that, that really horrible, violent nightmare gets put, internalized. And then you walk as a soldier in faith out to live it out. This story's power is recognized. And that's why Catherine's book is so important because she doesn't dodge the text. She actually says, guess what? Revelation might be the only hope at a time it's ha we're having a hard time finding hope if you're being honest about reality. If you look at the uh, economic situation, the ecological situation, if you look at the way our cultural anxieties across the globe are leading us to seek stories of nationalism and tribalism, and then we're ratcheting up this bit, like what are we going to do? And the best part about this book is John's revelation enables us to to do two things. Be honest that our situation super duper sucks. It's good news. Most theologians always got to paste some shiny paint on things and definitely ministers do. I know tithing, but Catherine embraces the real reality of this moment and says, if we're honest about how bad it is and we know the end is coming, perhaps that end is a new beginning of something we can't quite dream yet. So let us dream with the revelation. No S. Now, um, the other, uh, there were two other elements about this book in the next three minutes and 20 seconds, because I rarely finish on time, I want to emphasize. One, um, I, in, I think it's chapter five, the, uh, the, the chapter on boozy Babylon and the global economy. Uh, that's like the best chapter in a book I've read in the last year it is just so good. And here's the question that comes out of it about uh, that, uh, that I'm, I'm interested in. In some sense, um, globalization, and financialization are near complete. And so exactly how do we reintroduce the type of social web of networks that are necessary when you look at the last chapter that, um, uh, that Stephen just mentioned, mentioned uh, of the options to get one of the, you know, not impending death options. Like when the financialization, globalization uh, bet are getting complete, uh, how do we step out of that order? In, the, in that chapter, you explore the way in which a kind of Babylonian logic of domination then and now serves as a pseudo-moral vision that masquerades as a kind of pretext for raw power. The political rationality of neoliberalism gets normalized and then gets naturalized, which right like makes it even worse because you just assume that's how the world is. And that reduction of morality uh, to just the self and the family um, that, that, that Hayek dreamed that came true it involves a kind of elimination of the social, the web of relations. It creates a blindness to nature, neighbor, race, gender, class, and such. Um, how do we address uh, the elimination of the, the web of relations from the horizon of the moral uh, that globalization and financialization bring in. Um, 
it, what does it mean to reintroduce obligations or uh, responsibility uh, and, and such? Because I think there's a sense that um, the <laughs> the sacred canopy of old um, ha, has been financialized. And if you just think of the story, I mean, John Cobb's on here. He's talked about the way the World Bank and Trade Organization have basically, you know, expanded that uh, economic reach. So that there's not out, there's no outside. The 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 reach and dependency of the market's ubiquitous, and everyone in it, even people that thought now are feeling this compression where the possibilities for you and definitely your kids are less. And at the same time, this dependence comes in that raises the anxiety. I think that situation is so promising. And here's why I think your book is so important, because this book isn't a book. Uh, it's exploring a text revelation that are a collection of letters to churches. It's a collection of letters to communities that have a shared allegiance to an alternative to the kingdom of Caesar, uh, the lordship of Caesar. Um, there's more going on here than even our political philosophers' friends who return to Paul for the militant subject, there is a, a recognition that these letters, these subjects are formed in communities, in ecclesias, alternative uh, communities, um, embassies of reconciliation. That's an image that Paul uses. And I, and I had never realized just how powerful the recognition of communities are for thinking about resisting um, the power uh, that uh, th th this kind of like imperial nightmare comes over us. And, um, and so the last thing I'd say is that the dream reading, uh, and you know, one of the questions that I didn't get to just because John had already brought it up, is uh, th like, what does it mean you know, to practice dream reading I think you give us a good example that it includes at least three movements. And since no one's read the book, I won't give examples directly, but I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up. Part of dream reading involves rereading your past such that the, we, the, the web of responsibility, agency, destruction, and beauty that brought you to this moment is more clear. The other part is it involves reading the present um, that dreams that wake you up from a nightmare not to engage poorly, but in life-giving ways uh, in the present. The other, it, it rereads your future uh, and invites you into a possibility the imagination in the present doesn't contain. And it, in those three moves, like it so corresponds to Scrooge and the three hauntings he gets, right? And so Scrooge, the, you know, the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future um, is another, like, the, you know, those three letters, just like these letters to the churches. And I think the, the beautiful thing about your book, just like the end of that, is we wake up in a, we, we, you know, we wake up having fallen into our own grave. And it's only because the, the ghost of Christmas future is like, you're going to die a lonely, big loser without anything you've contributed to the world, you selfish, inward, twisted, you know, like, and he's shook and he's like, ah, and he falls in his own grave. It's only because he knows the reality of the possibilities he's bringing into being that he gets to wake up the next day. The world's the same one he was in, and yet the agency and the web of relations he had closed off from is before him, and he gladly and empowers other people. He reaches out for compassion and justice and all sorts of other things. So I'll end there and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Fuller, for that passionate response to Dr. Keller's book, which is a great lead in to Dr. Keller's response to the four insightful observations that our panelists have have made for us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> and right, I, I would I would like to just in a Buddhist way bow down uh, in meditative silence so we could all feel the reverberations of these marvelous presentations. Uh, I'm proud of my book if it managed to provoke these, these four lines of meditation. Uh, so yes, it was worth it. <laughs> but, but I think um, 
much richness was being articulated that might have in, in some sense been haunting my book or between the lines, but I think it was it was a very creative set of contributions of your own your own uh, four lines or planes of reflection. And, and um, you know, I'll just think a little bit <clears throat> with each of you and oh, then I'm glad we have time for a, a broader conversation. A theme that, that runs through uh, these responses is uh, appropriately that of, of possibility. And John, you tuned right in to <laughs> a gospel of possibility uh, being preached here, uh, perhaps also mostly between the lines, but maybe it bursts out uh, often enough and you're, you're right to tease out delicately uh, the, the process theology behind this dense sense of the possible. And I won't go into a lecture on Whitehead's doctrine of you know, eternal objects and how that's different from potentiality that is not eternal, but actually historical. And both forms of possibility inform every becoming actuality, every moment of bodily becoming, of coming to be uh, is, is taking in, is a taking in that incorporates, embodies in some at least slightly fresh way, possibilities, some very abstract, divine, uh, some also perhaps divinely tuned or perhaps not, being the flux of potentiality that our whole shared history represents. So there, there is a dense sense of possibility uh, behind the scenes of, of the book. And I try, I'm, I'm proud that I kept it behind the scenes. I didn't want the book to get uh, you know, top heavy with, with process theology or any kind of, of, of theological uh, argument uh, going beyond what seemed to be arising with some necessity from this, this dream reading. So of course, there's lots of theology in the book and some of it's quite manifest, but there's a lot that's kept uh, implicit, also partly because I want um, I want folk who aren't Christian and I want folk who aren't theists to occasionally read this book. Uh, probably not nearly as often as I thought that might happen, will it happen? But I, I tried to keep it from getting into a, a form of, of insider theology that, that um, would exclude more secular or non-Christian religious. Um, interlocutors. I, I did that more in this book than I have in any other book, but I think the the concept of possibility travels across <laughs> across theological and and um, secular registers rather meaningfully. So I'm I'm glad, John, that you you lifted up the intensive role that possibility plays. It's also a word I fall back on a lot. Um, as what revelation discloses, as what any hope that's not hype uh, embraces. Uh, it's not a guarantee. It's not necessarily even a probability. A possibility can be rather, rather wan, perhaps beautiful, <laughs> but weak. Uh, or it can, it can accrue great strength um, through, for instance, <laughs> social movements. Uh, so I'm glad to keep thinking with you all about, about what possibility means um, for, the, for the Whiteheadian God, whom I basically got from John Cobb. I'm very honored that he's able to be here today. Uh, of course, <laughs> we have from the get-go a profound deconstruction of any omnipotent controlling deity and therefore a deity who, you know, who offers possibility, uh, not just in an abstract sense of offering, but it's, it's in an, an erotic sense, a desiring sense that this process God is desiring greater 
complexity, richness, and togetherness of the cosmos. Um, it wants it to be more interesting, ever more interesting, and yet to hold together and therefore in some inherent way lovable. Uh, so those, those possibilities are offered with a certain divine appetite, an erotic uh, appeal. So the technical term divine lure in process theology is always, is always working in my head. Thank you very much, Dr. Cobb. Uh, and that divine lure in John Cobb's Christology can also be named uh, Christ as the Logos. Um, and that sense of divine possibility nonetheless does not exercise control. Uh, uh, it, it does not represent power over. It has uh, almost nothing to do with classical omnipotence. Oh, but that doesn't make it wimpy or weak or irrelevant. Um, it perhaps makes it a little more real, a little more possible as an actually thinkable, perhaps even feelable kind of divinity or a sense of the sacred than uh, much of what we have uh, inherited. Uh, it's very lightness of touch gives it a certain plausibility and doesn't get us all tangled up in theodicy arguments about why would God let these horrible things happen or actually cause them. Um, and of course, apocalypse gets leaking through those questions. So possibilities, <laughs> may they keep coming forth uh, and may we keep remembering they guarantee nothing and they can only do something in as much as we embody them and we can embody them in individual creative ways, that's great, that's something, but it's nothing like embodying them uh, together in more forceful solidarities that cross across the, the close to impossible asymmetries, differences, oppressive relations that have, that have kept us so well uh, at odds with each other and with the earth uh, as a species. So these are, these are tough possibilities to tune to and, and to open up. So John, that's <laughs> more than you were asking for, but maybe a bit of theological background for the discussion. But uh, yeah, I, I'm delighted that you uh, raised the question of the practice of, of dream reading and of what texts, or whether it's only of texts. Um, and, and yeah, I was thinking of it, first of all, as a way of talking about a reading that's not, uh, that's not a, a literal reading and that's also um, not a merely historical uh, reading that vastly separates John's context from ours so that the vibes of, of relevance uh, <laughs> just fade out in between uh, so that there could be some way of addressing um, and taking responsibility for the relevance that goes on for good and for ill of that text uh, without just trying to reduce it um, to a distant uh, historical letter, uh, but to, to let the, the intensity of the connections travel uh, between us while maintaining, hopefully, uh, an adequate um, and rather constant attention to the historical, biblical, contextual criticism that has been brought to bear on this text and, and all the others. Uh, so, first of all, dream reading was a way of getting at that, making dream reading a transitive verb gives a, an awkwardness, a sort of thing I, I often do, make, 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 it, make a new word or word combo so that it's awkward and gives, gives us pause, um, so that one actually dream reads a text, one isn't just dream reading intransitively. Uh, but I, I would think one is dream reading any text in which there's space offered for, for the not quite known uh, for the, the epiphatic in theology, for some sense of mystery or mere dire uncertainty, uh, that there's, there's space uh, and in fact the need for a certain dream reading when a text builds into itself uh, its, its dimensions of the unknown and, and for all of its apparent uh, boisterous, forceful, aggressive certitude, the Book of Revelation is a, a book of quite hallucinatory imagery, it's images, uh, micro narratives. Uh, so uh, 
it has nothing resembling what we in the modern West mean by uh, certainty uh, or even by knowledge. So a certain dream reading uh, is what John was doing, partly of previous prophetic texts, especially Daniel. Uh, and I'm suggesting we dream read him. But yeah, I have to dream read process and reality, indeed, because I have to dream up what's really being met, meant, you know, with all those, all those uh, rather abstract concepts <laughs> in, intuitively <laughs> appealing uh, for an imaginative leap. Uh, so whenever we're needing to work with, work with our imagination in a text, uh, especially if we're invited to, there's a dream reading going on. But even when we're not invited to, uh, I think uh, a dream reading is appropriate. The dreams might often be suppressed within a text, uh, as in so much uh, of the, you know, the white episteme that, that insists on a kind of flat surface of textuality. Uh, so uh, that I think all of our reading of texts would benefit from opening the text itself up to its own unconscious and letting our own our own unconscious emit its nightmares, its dreams, so that yes, <laughs> those nightmares can get more uh, more conscious. As Trip <laughs> is indicating, they better, or else we'll just impose them on the world. But I would think dream reading is a metaphor. Um, might also uh, obtain for any situation at all. In anything that we could say we read, we read a person's mood, uh, we read uh, the, the, the atmosphere in a room, we read the temperature, we read the temperature of a day. I would think uh, there's some element of, of the oniric, the dream that can enter in. So the, uh, and, and, and it's crucial to politics, isn't it? Uh, this kind of dream reading. I mean, I'll just <laughs> remind us of the role of I have a dream uh, in, in human history. Um, as to minding, yes, just yes, John, I'm so glad you brought forth the Buddha. I'm sorry, <laughs> dear Gautama, that I only referenced you once. I'm sorry that I, I couldn't do more uh, of, of, of an inter, interreligious uh, discussion in the book more, I'd love to use more of your comparative theology uh, in, in following through on this text. And that, that might be actually a conversation to be had in the future um, that's begun here. But I, I was certainly hoping that in, that, in the strong use of, of minding uh, and occasional use of mindfulness in, res in relation to minding the apocalypse, that both the sense of minding as you know, remaining attentive, conscious of, uh, and the sense of minding as being bothered by, like, yeah, I mind that you say that. <laughs> it, it, it really irks me. Uh, I mind <laughs> where capitalism has taken us. So uh, that there's a, a mindfulness of the Buddha sort that allows us to hold it together, a kind of, of, of meditative practice and and I was, of course, hoping that this dream reading of the Book of Revelation might have some element of a, of a Buddhist reading. Again, it's from John Cobb that I learned at about age 20 <laughs> that uh, before I had met him, I read him uh, that Christianity needs transformation by Buddhism. And Buddhism also benefits from some edges of, of learning from uh, Christianity. Uh, and, precisely uh, for Christianity to get free of its egocentric sense of, of salvation. It needed something like the, the no self uh, and the practices of mindfulness that open up and that make then the forms of solidarity that we hope for in relation to social justice and the environment actually possible. Um, some of that uh, interconnectedness um, that you've all helped me think about. So yes, to the Buddhism, I'm gonna be much shorter now so that we have really some good discussion time. Um, but thank you, John, as ever and ever. And Andrea, <laughs> I'm glad you brought some deep mining, <laughs> not extractivism, of course, but some, some digging down of, of that kind of mining in, into play with the minding in the sense that there's a, um, there's a meditation you 
very much underscored and coming from you, that's very important to me. And because your work um, does, does uh, such <laughs> brilliant minding <laughs> and mining of the possibilities within a religious naturalism also affected by process thought uh, and, and now contributing so massively to the, to the meaning of, of our embodiment of our animality and all red. <laughs> Uh, read very sharply and dream read in relation uh, to racial difference uh, than your, your sense of meditative uh, eco-political uh, practice is, is crucial to me. And I just want to also express my gratitude that you found a certain register uh, of affect coming through the book. I mean, I think that's what I was hoping for also in backing up a bit from, from doing a more academic kind of text. Um, so that this dreaminess, even with its nightmare tinges, uh, helps us to feel those feelings of the world that, uh, that underlie and motivate uh, our thinking, but also uh, our action or lack thereof. <laughs> and so that feeling uh, mournful, uh, sometimes even hopeful, uh, that feeling as always to be felt in our bodies, even even <laughs> on this screen where, where we're missing a dimension of ourselves with these two dimensions playing out. Uh, nonetheless, there's an embodiment that, that, we, that we do feel uh, through this couple of senses here operative. And, and I think what you're saying is really important um, in relation to the horrors that we feel uh, at the the ongoing, the unbelievably ongoing but very believably ongoing uh, murders of African Americans uh, and by police um, this week, we're able to catch some breath on that front. Uh, all of these all of these horrors uh, that require, um, if we're going to change the patterns that allow them, that, that actually foster and facilitate them, uh, we're going to have to draw forth uh, more of that affect that is bodily on our own part that keeps us then vulnerable to our interdependencies with other vulnerable bodies, very, very different uh, from our own. And as you point out, that's, intraspecies, that's also interspecies. So I'm just really grateful for your pointing out the, the loose and partial connectivities um, that hold us together in our endless interdependency, interdependency that's endlessly repressed by the exceptionalist ideologies of independent and masterful uh, egos. Uh, so that attentiveness then is First of all, an attentiveness to the felt, the felt bodily qualities, and of course, that's, that's what in process theology is the the prehension uh, that that we have before we have consciousness at every moment, <laughs> and that electrons and, and cells also have in their own way. Um, so much gratitude for your bringing forth the 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 multiple registers of bodily affect uh, that we need to think <laughs> together in our thinking. Um, and so keep that thinking, um, felt thinking, uh, which is to say thinking embodied individually and collectively, uh, like even as ultimately <laughs> the earth that we are. Oh, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks for juxtaposing the two books. That was like good therapy for me. Um, you just named the, the differences so lucidly. Um, and I, I'm, I'm feeling just relieved that you're naming the second one a, a darker book. Uh, and I, I didn't spend much time drilling back down into uh, Apocalypse 
now and then when I wrote this one, I really felt I had to keep my distance from it. When I got into it, I would feel I, I still liked it and, and was with it and I could look up a lot of references in it that were still useful. But it, it did feel like a different epoch, like a different millennium. And, and it's not a simple difference, of course, and you didn't make it out to be one. It's not the difference between, you know, the radical hope that <laughs> some of us coming, coming into consciousness already in the late 60s, um, some of us before that, uh, felt all through that last century. It's uh, the difference between that hope and now um, a hope that if we can name it at all is, um, is as you say, a, a chastened, a haunted hope. I'm, I'm glad that came through. I mean, I was aware in this book that I was feeling a little inhibited uh, at even using the word hope, not because I lack hope. Um, I hope my hope has not been Pollyannish, at least for several decades. Uh, I, I suspect it's not. Uh, I hope was hard to come by in my particular early life uh, existence. So I, I, I rather hard one. I, I don't think it's ever been cheap for me. Uh, but uh, I would, <laughs> I would feel inhibited. Uh, I think now because I because I I, I have so many friends, uh, interlocutors, students, who maybe just don't even want to use the word hope at all. You know, for whom hope is really passe. And you know, and they're uh, they're fine books, like Miguel de la Torres called Embracing Hopelessness, which he does from a Christian, a biblical scholar's point of view, to embrace hopelessness and just sees hope as, as a kind of, of, of white uh, bourgeois uh, escape syndrome or way to make oneself feel good. Um, the analysis is excellent, but I think it applies to uh, optimism which often passes it as hope, but is actually something quite different. Um, so I'm glad you brought out the haunted quality of the hope, but I'll remain hesitant to use the term hope because it gets misused and misheard so readily, it gets confused with optimism, with some kind of, oh, it'll be all right in the end, don't worry, uh, affect, or, uh, or even uh, <laughs> progress optimism, and then the other form, the. Uh, kind of fundamentalist uh, optimism because, you know, we're going to be saved even as the, the earth is, <laughs> is totally wasted. Um, so there are a lot of forms of hope that I wouldn't want to identify with. Um, so I'm glad you named the, the, the hauntedness of this particular kind of metaphors, which I think goes on generating, yes, <laughs> affects and effects. I, I love Jane Bennett's book by that name about Walt Whitman, which is looking at the, at the role of bodily affects um, and, and the, therefore ethical uh, and material effects uh, that, that come uh, if, we, if we tune more mindfully to our shared uh, materiality. You know, it's a meditation in and of the, the new materialism. So, I'm not going back to those <laughs> seven by sevens. I'm I'm delighted and appalled that you share the same <laughs> the same uh, numerological issue with your name now. <laughs> Passed it on. <laughs> so um, I'm just uh, very very grateful uh, for all the work, Stephen, that you've done on so many registers of <laughs> of a of apocalyptic irony, even bringing out some of John's irony. It's not always you treating him sarcastically at all, it, but it just endless brilliant um, disclosures of what the apocalypse is about um, because of its intentions in spite of its intentions, because of endless misconstruals and reconstruals. Um, so yeah, uh, if I, been eating the scroll, I think it's largely because of Stephen Moore's work that <laughs> it's as digestible as it is for me. Um, and, and yes, that numerology of 1.5. Um, I'll just say about that numerology of 1.5. So 
you know, it's the 2018 uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that determined that it's 1.5 that has to 1.5 degrees that needs to be the target, uh, and the steps needed to meet it. Uh, and that in essence, we'd have to cut emissions nearly in half by 2030, and then to net zero by 2050. So I won't use that facile <laughs> notion of hope that could easily float in here. I won't use the word hope about it at all right now, but I'll just say it's interesting, it's meaningful that, that those are exactly the targets that, that the new administration has set. Emissions in half by 2030, net zero by 2050. So it's an exact coordination with the IPCC. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, it does mean it has a chance. It has a chance. <laughs> um, and I won't go into the numerology of that chance, but I would think it would be the worst kind of nihilistic cowardice uh, to avoid recognizing that there's a real chance. It's easier to stay nihilistic, to stay cynical when these chances open up because we are likely to get very badly disappointed again by all the backlash that will come against these good green moves that are being attempted uh, uh, and against the compromises that will be made to make them happen. It, of course, we're going to suffer a lot of disappointment. So it's maybe easier just to stay nihilist and not feel any hope uh, about those targets being set. But I think that would be cowardly. I think we have to <laughs> make ourselves vulnerable to, to some, some expectation that uh, our, our work together on climate, our work together on racism, our work together on class, <laughs> on gender, on sexuality, that these shared works are really worth it. In closing trip, I can't possibly, can't possibly rise to the occasion of your <laughs> comedic brilliance. So I won't say much um, except um, thank you for bringing in, into play here uh, for our discussion with some vividness the, the, web of, the web of relations. I just wanna hook that sense of that web of relations. Obviously that's endlessly a, a process metaphor as well as a deep feminist uh, metaphor, but that web of relations also has taken on new meaning in its coalescence, hasn't it, with intersectionality coming out of, of black feminism as a metaphor. Um, and so the, the rigorous political meaning of intersectionality now is, is twining uh, with uh, a perception of the web of relations as actually ontological and theological uh, and <laughs> ethical, social, political, ecological. It's a complex web. Uh, and so that intersectionality uh, gives, it, gives it a certain rigorous ethical push uh, that I think we can continue to learn uh, endlessly much from, especially from the communities of black feminists who first formulated the need to think intersectionally. Um, and I love, I love then thinking together with that intersectionality, that's a more spatial metaphor, your, your temporal imagery of rereading the past, of <laughs> dreaming the present, uh, actually the present, <laughs> and imagining then out of that, out of that dream of the present happening, uh, a future. Um, and I tried seven from dire to really not bad, uh, rural, urban, uh, anyway, you can read them. Uh, and, and I didn't, I didn't uh, place my odds on any one of them. But I, I, just, I just want to say that it's, it's beautiful to see the way in which the past of all of our relations that have constituted us as a species, as a people, as in peoples, as individuals, within um, all of those relations that have constituted us as, as a history, then are gurgling in this fraught present, uh, in these dense intersections um, that, that can be dreamt and projected <laughs> as nightmares that have not been 
process, as you put it, and that make for then the repression of dreams, <laughs> the repression of the deep dreams that could transform the world. Uh, or rather we can, we can dream read uh, together, become conscious of the, un of the unconscious, the unconscious of our, of our white supremacism, the unconscious of, of our forms of, of elitism, the unconsciousness of, uh, of our speciesism. We can work to get those, get those dreams sifted through the nightmares and into a consciousness in which, in which better choices actually unfold into, into better futures, not distant ones, but ones starting now and now and now. And those futures that are actually just an important part of, <laughs> of, of abiding in the present, of staying with its troubles uh, because the the intersections of pasts and futures are happening uh, right here in this present. I, I'm stopping there, um, having taken too long, but now we have some time for some discussion more broadly. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Um, there are, I've had several questions, and so I will, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and read them from the folks that have been brave enough to, um, to put their question in writing. Uh, the first one comes from a uh, Drew doctoral student, Lindsey Grass. She asks, I'm wondering if the planetary pushback, like the rise in temperature, et cetera, is perhaps a move of divine violence, erupting the mythic violence of, of anthropocentrism, et alia, in which case might the disclosure of apocalypse be a release of anthropocentric campaign for survival and instead a recognition of our finitude within the grand scheme of creation? <laughs> well, that's a very Lindsay question. <laughs> I can't possibly answer it, but uh, just, to, just thank you for that, for that set of connections, Lindsay. Um, it's easy to read planetary, planetary pushback as, as divine violence and maybe in the Benjaminian sense of, of, uh, of a violence against human injustice, uh, a violence uh, that is triggered by human violence. One could do that. I resist it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't feel, I don't feel um, motivated or inspired by going in that particular direction of apocalypse of seeing uh, seeing Gaia as getting vengeance uh, and seeing then Gaia's vengeance as as a feminine <laughs> material mask of of divine vengeance um, divine violence uh, but there's judgment and if divine judgment is still a meaningful metaphor then certainly um, we have to understand our contributions to the to the undoing of the ten thousand year Holocene uh, as very much a, a judgeable effect of collective human actions, and of some of us much more than of others of us, of course. You know, but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to leap right to divine violence. I would think the divine is. It's not needing to trigger uh, Earth's violence, and I would think Earth doesn't need to have affects of, of vengeance involved, uh, but responses that work for as much <laughs> as much life uh, sustainability as possible, uh, and as much evolutionary, revolutionary transformation as might make more sustainable change possible. So I'm not sure that, that metaphors of, of vengeance and violence don't get us hooked into the really dangerous aspects of the book of Revelation. And yet I think we have to go there too and meditate with them and then find ways to translate our way out of them, out of leaving the vengeance as mere vengeance, translating it back into um, a discernment that exposes the consequences 
of actions uh, for what they are and responds as is possible and necessary to prevent more of the same systemic violence. And it's, it's not hard to quickly translate that into rage, violence, and vengeance. And I empathize with those affects that wouldn't want to capture them theologically. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Uh, one of your colleagues at Drew, Dr. Terry Todd, has a question for you. Uh, and it comes off of, uh, of uh, another of his colleague, colleagues uh, comment of Dr. Stephen Moore. He writes, Stephen Moore has noted capitalism's role in this apocalyptic moment and in your book. Could we convert the richest person in the world and his shareholders to reflect on the apocalypse? Or do we have to destroy the beast? In other words, are some forms of capitalism and capitalists potential allies in the quest to open up possibilities we haven't yet dreamed of? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think part of the form of apocalypticism I resist is where it goes into a purity of good and evil uh, so that my anti-capitalist position would be pure and capitalists would be purely evil. I know that most of what I do in my life is entangled in uh, a capitalist order that I'm a little bit responsible for. Uh, and so I'm not pure. Um, I, think, I think we shouldn't be pure in the quest for solidarities. I think we want solidarities across all all kinds of divides. It isn't a matter of agreeing then with everything that someone in solidarity with you brings. If Gates wants to put billions of dollars into a greener economy, I'm not going to just assume that's, that's, an, uh, that's a trick of evil. I'm not going to assume that uh, all the good will come of it that would be promised uh, and that one might hope for. I think we want to work work uh, wisely uh, with, with the possibility that, um, that the super rich uh, and the systems that they control can undergo significant change and do, do see, the, some of them do see the danger of their own collapse if they don't change significantly along with the collapse of most of what is called um, civilization. So I, I would think it's important not to be too apocalyptically pure. And also I think it's important to retain a certain apocalyptic edge of judgment against the economic system and therefore to call for conversion <laughs> uh, and to be suspicious about the performances of green capitalism, but also uh, to be open to actual change, but only because then as a step is taken from that direction, uh, we can take steps uh, into the solidarity that mean we can hold that uh, that source of capitalist wealth uh, also accountable step-by-step uh, step towards moving towards a different, a different system altogether. But it won't happen by nuking this one. But, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it looks like we'll have we'll have time, I think probably for just one more question. And thank you for those that uh, that posed questions. Uh, this is from Dr. Glenn Mazes. Um, how is the poetic related to opening up dream reading and to opening possibilities that are emerging and to also mindfulness? Ah, the philosopher and poet Glenn Mazes is asking. Um, 
the the kind of theology that I actually want to be doing and fostering these days calls itself theopoiesis. So understanding that theology taps its better resources from its own poetics, but poiesis here doesn't just mean poetry as a literary form, it also means in the, in the original sense of the term, a making, uh, so a doing. So it's an, so, so Theo poiesis in that way theologically combines a kind of a kind of poetry with <laughs> with all of its sensitivities to the divine lure or the beauty that might attract us um, in the human and the non-human world. All that sense of beauty gets then hooked up to a rigorous sense of of a practice uh, of, of a doing uh, in order to bring on the changes that allow for a more poetic shared life. I suppose what has hooked me as a theologian into working too much on scripture, uh, another book on, on the apocalypse, and I have a long book on you know, the first chapter of Genesis. Um, but I, I, I think it's probably the poetic force of those texts uh, captures me in my awareness that that poetic force also has enormous political potency uh, because of the strong influence of those Alpha Omega texts uh, on our history, our history theological and, and secular. Um, but the thing about poetry is it, it it crosses so beautifully between religious and, and secular worlds. Uh, it prohibits any simple line between the spiritual and the political, doesn't it? Um, it, it forbids any false certainties, but it also, <laughs> it also uh, frees us from inhibitions whereby we might just stay silent because we know that we don't know. Uh, so instead, poetry, I think, gives us, gives us some courage to experiment, uh, to play with language, to, to let, it, let it dream itself differently through us. And, and reading these, of course, terribly formative texts as poetry is crucial to their redemption as meaningful texts that can be meaningful to more than you know, biblicists. Uh, it redeems the text to read them as poetic and it also helps to redeem the world from the ill effects of biblical texts like the book of Revelation, which was used in so many hideous, violent, crusading ways as I go through in my book um, as well is used for all the, all the revolutions of the Western world uh, towards a greater, a greater good. So liberating these texts poetically is I think an important inspiration for all of your forms of poetics in language, in art, in feeling, in embodiment, in community building, in activist leadership, in the poetics of your teaching, of your collective dreaming, of your struggling, uh, of your saying no, of your saying <laughs> another kind of yes. This, um, the theo poetics that uh, is a theopoiesis goes deep theologically uh, also in that, that uh, there's, an, there's an ancient sense of, of the divine as, as therefore <laughs> poet of the world that um, helps free us from any specter of a God who's gonna just you know, come down and fix it for us uh, at best, this is a God who's going to poetically inspire us to, to transform our world um, in solidarity with each other.
Thanks, Catherine. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there's time for. I'm glad, Glenn. <laughs> So I uh, would like to take a moment, friends, to uh, to thank Dan Seidel for his expert uh, um, moderation of this event and also our wonderful panelists uh, and especially our uh, distinguished, esteemed, uh, theopoetic force, uh, Catherine Keller, who we are so uh, grateful for. It is true poetry gives us courage, but so do gatherings such as this and so does work and collaboration such as this. So thank you. I want to invite everyone to unmute and let's clap so that we can really hear the appreciation we have. Thank you, Thank you. I'm glad that's been recorded. <laughs> and I will try to respond to the other questions by email that I've got in the, in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. So 